Good morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Dungan from the Division of Clinical Genetics, and I'm happy this morning to introduce our speaker for Grand Rounds, uh, Dr. Douglas Stewart. Doug is Senior Investigator in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at the National Cancer Institute. He received his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and then trained in internal medicine at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He completed fellowship training in clinical genetics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He was granted scientific tenure at the NIH in 2019. Um, Dr. Stewart focuses on the characterization of cancer phenotype and quantification of risk from germ germline variants especially in monogenic uh, tumor predisposition disorders. Okay, so um, he will uh, take it from here as usual. Uh, please enter any questions in the chat box and we'll uh, go over those at the end of his uh, presentation. So Dr. Stewart, thanks for being with us. Uh, well, thank you for, for having me. Let me pull up my slides here. Um, and um, I appreciate the, the invite. And um, I've gotten to know Jeff over the last couple of years because we've served on an ACMG committee. Um, and uh, it's always a good way to get to know people. I um, have a few connections to Northwestern. My grandmother was an undergraduate there for, uh, I think just a year in the late 1930s. And then she left to get married. So I guess that, that was a good thing for me. Um, and then in the early 2000s, when I was a fellow at um, Penn, was working on a project on uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, the genetics of polycystic ovary syndrome with a geneticist by the name of Richard Spielman. And um, uh, we, we went out to, we had a collaborator at Northwestern, uh, Andre, uh, Andrea Deneif, who I understand left recently, and um, we, we enjoyed working with her. So today I would like to um, tell you about our work on DICER-1 and provide some ideas of, uh, on, um, as the title says, a genome first public health strategy to eliminate uh, a childhood tumor predisposition disorder. I know that's a, a bold claim, but I think there are a number of elements uh, in place that, um, that are, have a lot of power and certainly could be applied to other um, monogenic disorders. So here's the outline of my talk. Um, I'll talk about some of the clinical features and the surveillance strategies, what we mean by this genome first approach, and then a brief comment on some work beyond DICER-1, applying some of these principles. So we'll first talk about some of the key, the key clinical features. I realize this is a rare disorder. Not everyone may uh, have seen a patient with a DICER-1 syndrome uh, or know very much about it. Um, here on a single slide is, um, so a lot of the key features is an autosomal dominant tumor predisposition disorder, and it arises from a pathogenic germline uh, variant in the microRNA processing gene DICER1. And I have here a picture of the, um, of the paper and the authors from Science in 2009, where my pathology colleague, Ashley Hill, conducted linkage analysis on a set of large families with familial pleuropulmonary blastoma, or PPB, the uh, sort of hallmark tumor associated with DICER-1 syndrome. Um, we'll go into a little bit more detail on this a, a little bit later, but the PPB is a, a lung sarcoma, uh, most common uh, uh, childhood, primary childhood lung cancer. Um, other common tumors seen in the DICER-1 syndrome include a variety of gynecologic tumors, including the Sertoli Leydig cell tumor and gynoandroblastoma. These are so-called sex cord stromal tumors. In addition, we do see uh, a rhabdomyosarcoma in DICER-1, but it is essentially always seen or only seen in the, um, in the cervix. Younger children um, can uh, develop cystic nephroma. This is distinct from uh, adult versions of cystic nephroma. This is more of a pediatric one. We see a lot of multinodule goiter as well as thyroid cancer and um, macrocephaly and um, a smattering of different types of brain tumors, which we'll list a little bit later. Um, here's some more about the genetics. Um, uh, for those of you who may take a genetics board exam, there's the chromosomal location if, if, you, if you ever need that. Um, and you can see it's a, sort of a medium sized gene um, and it encodes a endoribonuclease involved in microRNA production. 
And there are two key domains here. Um, uh, RNAs 3A cleaves the three prime uh, microRNA strand and the three B domain cleaves the five prime microRNA strand. And the development of tumors, um, both malignant and benign uh, in this disorder follow a modified Knudsen two-hit hypothesis. And usually it works this way in which an individual is born with a germline or constitutional loss of function variant. And then um, a second hit um, almost always in one of these five codons listed here um, develops. And interestingly, the second hit is not a loss of function variant, another um, uh, truncating mutation, but it's um, a missense variant that confers what's called a neomorphic, neomorphic function. So it doesn't quite kill the function of the gene, it just slightly modifies it. And that's a, a key importance and a key distinction from most Newton two hit hypotheses. Anyhow, the result is that we have defective production of mature microRNAs and as a result, alter regulatory ability and increased risk for cancer. So again, here's a sort of a summary slide of the key features of the Dicer-1 syndrome. Um, as noted, it, it, there's a variety of benign and malignant tumors in both children and adults. And I list here on the left, more common tumors and common of course is a relative term. These are all pretty rare, but um, in the general population certainly, and even within Dicer-1 syndrome, um, uh, all things are relative. So pleuropulmonary blastoma, the lung sarcoma we mentioned, thyroid nodules and Frank Goiter. We also see a variety of types of thyroid carcinoma, most commonly well-differentiated um, thyroid carcinoma, including follicular and pa uh, papillary, but poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma has also been reported. We see the female sex cord stromal tumors, as mentioned, this is the pediatric cystic nephroma, the rhabdomyosarcoma of the cervix, um, and then a nasal tumor called a nasal chondromesenchymal hematoma. Um, that is benign histology, but can be locally um, aggressive and uh, can be morbid in, in regards to its sort of exten extension locally. And then there's an unusual eye tumor that uh, we rarely see called an ocular medulloepithelioma. And then I have over here on the right, less common tumors um, or tumors that are more relatively recently described and we don't really know exactly how common they are. So Wilms tumor, um, some intracranial sarcomas, renal sarcomas, um, um, in addition to the pineal blastoma, you get pituitary blastoma. Um, we recently reported a, a teratoma-like um, malignancy that developed in the, in the abdomen. There's um, also relatively recently described a, what we call plur uh, peritoneal pleuropulmonary blastoma, which I realize is a little nonsensical because we're <laughs> describing the development of a lung lesion in the abdomen, but it has uh, histologically uh, features of the PPB. There was a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine about a year ago that described um, multi-cystic hepatic lesions um, in people with Dicer-1. And then we have a paper in press that describes, um, that reports testicular stromal tumors, so totally, um, and Leydig cell tumors. So this is a paper uh, picture, a figure from a paper we published in Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2019 that summarizes um, the burden of disease and the Dicer-1 syndrome. And you can see it primarily arises in, the bulk of it is in childhood. We have on the y-axis here, types of tumor, the, PP, the different types of PPB, which I'll get into in a moment, the Sertoli Leydig cell tumor, and these nasal tumors here, and then age along um, the x-axis. Um, and you can see the PPB, the cystic nephroma, are predominantly childhood phenomena, although we do get a few outliers into sort of early adolescence for the cystic nephroma. The Sertoli Leydig cell tumors definitely develop early in childhood, but you can see they can extend out. The oldest known cases we have are in the early 60s. Um, and the rhabdomyosarcoma of the cervix really remarkably tends to be uh, in, um, in girls, uh, not observed by us over the age of, of 18 or so. And then there are a variety of other tumors. So as mentioned, the PPB is, is the primary driver of morbidity and mortality in the Dicer-1 syndrome and um, is uh, a the most common primary lung cancer childhood. And it comes in three flavors. So we have the type one PPB and the type one is, is a cystic lesion, but it does have a layer of malignant cells. And it, this is data from, um, the PPB Dicer-1 registry that we put together um, about five years ago. 
um, the median age, you can see the median age of diagnosis and the fact that the mass majority of these, um, uh, the overall five-year survival is quite good. They can present with some shortness of breath or pneumothorax or can be incidentally found. This is literally a textbook picture and most of these are not so dramatically big uh, and, and obvious as this, they're usually quite a bit smaller, but a cystic lesion in childhood should prompt you to think about Dicer 1 as a possibility. Now, interestingly, in some individuals, these lesions progress to type two, two, type two or type three. And it's usually by the age of seven, um, more typically even younger than that. As you can see, the median age of diagnosis is 36 months. And the type two here is a mixed cystic and solid tumor type of primitive sarcoma. You can see the overall survival here starts to drop to 71%. And then children here present with shortness of breath, weight loss, fever, or an opacity on a chest film. And then these can also move on to the type three, which is really a solid tumor, high-grade sarcoma, uh, present typically a slightly older age, uh, worse overall survival, and they present with signs and symptoms similar to that of the type two. Now, the good news, if, if, if you can call it that, and I, th I think you can in this circumstance, is that the risk of PPB, as well as other Dicer 1 associated tumors, can be managed. Um, and let me tell you how. So I've mentioned that the type 1 um, will progress to type 2 uh, in early childhood. So anything we can do to prevent this progression um, is worth considering. So what often happens is that this type 1 regresses to what we call the type 1R. And um, this is a, a partial or usually complete regression of the type 1 to a simple cyst that has, you know, you never say never in medicine, but essentially zero malignant potential. And the vast majority of these are asymptomatic. And this is a typical chest CT of a person with a germline Dicer 1 variant. And you see a few scattered cysts there that early on in their childhood would have presented a malignant potential to develop into a PPB, but did not. So clearly the PPB is a highly morbid cancer if not detected in time, but it is amenable to screening and, and cure given that there is this limited window of vulnerability, this limited window of progression to the, the sarcoma. There are good screening tools in the form of chest CT. I acknowledge there's a radiation exposure and there is good therapy in the term of a, of a, a partial or total lobectomy. Um, of the involved lung segment, which again is a, is a, is a procedure, but um, offers cure. So the vision that, that we have in this program is that the early detection and cure of PPB and other Dicer-1 associated tumors is possible through early prospective identification of Dicer-1 pathogenic variants. So again, here's this sort of, uh, uh, dogmatic presentation of the type one progressing to the type type three. And we want to do everything we can to prevent that. So how do we, how do we do that? Well, one is uh, we developed a multi-pronged approach to, to, to trying to understand this. And the first thing is understanding how, just how common are pathogenic, the P or likely pathogenic germline variants in the population. So that was one question. The second is what's the penetrance and the risk of this, uh, of, of these variants? How, how much of a problem is this in somebody who, who does harbor one of these uh, risk alleles? Another strategy is to identify phenotypes, not just the tumor phenotypes, but other non-tumor phenotypes that clinically, if you detect them, would prompt testing of, um, of an individual. And then that might lead to cascade testing for a family to identify individuals, especially children at risk, and then appropriate surveillance can be done. And then of course the development of surveillance guidelines themselves. What, what do I do with an individual who has one of these germline risk variants? Um, what exactly do they need? And then uh, a little bit later in the talk, I'll, I'll discuss our development of, in, of interpretation standards of Dicer-1 variants. Uh, how do we all agree that a variant is pathogenic or likely pathogenic or not, or we're not certain that it's a, a variant of uncertain significance? And then we, I'll briefly talk about some other, other ideas that are more along these sort of genome first approaches. So a lot of, all of our work um, has been through a natural history study in Dicer-1 um, at the NIH. Um, 
And this has been open for almost 10 years now. And we work very closely with the PPB Dicer One Registry at, at Children's um, Minnesota in uh, Minneapolis. And this is a picture of the NIH Clinical Center. It's a, you know, the world's largest research hospital here in Bethesda. Uh, you can see across the street is the, um, what is now the new Walter Reed, but is, that's the Bethesda Naval Hospital Tower. And this was a picture I took in the late 2008 or 2009 following a spring um, thunderstorm. So in the study, we have uh, individuals you know, do genetic testing and counseling and identify in a you know, family and who carries a variant and who is um, not carrying a variant. So we invite as many people as we can for a visit to the NIH Clinical Center. We pay for travel. Um, and for the people who do carry a Dicer-1 pathogenic variant, they undergo a lung CT, if not, if they haven't had one recently, and we collect skin fibroblasts. And they, as well as their family controls, undergo a pretty thorough evaluation. So uh, history and physical, we collect labs, we collect pathologic materials if they've had tumors and so forth resected other hospitals. Um, and uh, DNA, we do ultrasound of the relevant organs at risk in this disorder. Uh, they see a variety of surgical, uh, a variety of surgical and medical subspecialists as listed here. So this next few slides uh, present work uh, results from our, our work within this, this protocol. And as mentioned, one of the first questions we had was just how common are pathogenic germline Dicer-1 variants. And uh, working with uh, uh, postdoctoral fellow, Jung Kim, who actually did her PhD at Northwestern, uh, finished up about five years ago. Um, what, what we did was we pulled data from the non-cancer portion of the exome aggregation consortium. So this was a data set put together five years ago, which has 53,000 exomes um, pulled from a variety of different studies. So it's not a true population study, but it is a, obviously a large number of exomes. And we asked just quite simply, you know, how often do we see um, loss of function variants in Dicer-1 in these 53,000 exomes? And Jung found one canonical splice and four stop gained. You can see the allele count here for a total of five alleles. And then you do the math, five in 53,000, and it works out to be one in 10,600. So this was published, uh, you can see a couple of years ago. Um, and was striking to us because this was a lot more common than we expected. You know, you think of PPB um, as uh, pretty rare and uh, affecting a couple dozen children each year in the United States. And so we were surprised by this. Um, and actually we have a follow-up number on that. And I'll talk about this study a little bit later, but we've been working with the Geisinger Health System in Pennsylvania, uh, who has undertaken you know, large scale sequencing of, of um, of their subjects within their health system, obviously following consent and so forth. And so when we looked at this data set, there were a little over 92,000 individuals. And again, taking the same or very similar definition of pathogenicity of variant, truncating variants, um, frame shift um, and, and the canonical splice, um, as well as looking at some of these missense hotspot variants, we asked how often do you see these variants in these 92,000 people? Well, we found 12 uh, unique variants in 25 people. Um, and that works out when you do the math, you're 25 and 92,000 to be one in 3,700. And then if you take a little bit more conservative approach and say, well, well, I just wanna look at the people who are unrelated and so forth, that number goes to one in 4,600. So that's even more common than the one in 10,000 number that we had provided. And this is uh, work that's in press now at JAMA Network Open. So, Getting back to the question of risk and penetrance, um, one of the things we did uh, using the data we collected from our study after a number of years was uh, tabulate, tabulate tumors and, and who had developed them. And this was work that was published in Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2019. And this is a plot that just simply <clears throat> shows the cumulative incidence here on the y-axis of a variety of tumors, the PPB, the Sertoli Lydigs, the cystic nephromas, and then in black, all neoplasms. Um, and this is obviously a, sort of a very dramatic um, figure that shows 
if you you know read this literally, that by you know early childhood, um, you know twenty five percent of people carry a malignancy. This is data from one hundred seventeen Dicer one carries one hundred fifty two. Neoplasms. Now, of course, the, the key thing here is that this is both probands and non probands. These are people who were specifically recruited because they had tumors, as well as their family members that we identified from genetic testing. So, really, the more perhaps useful number would be what's the risk of these tumors in the non probands? You know, remove the people who had been specifically ascertained and recruited. And that's what this figure shows on this table. This is again from the same paper. This is buried in the supplement here, the actual table of data, but, and this is the figure that, that shows this data. Um, and as the title here says, non-proband Dicer-1 carrier cumulative age-specific neoplasm risk. And in this study, we defined it neoplasm risk as cancers as well as the cystic necroma and the uh, nasal tumor because they, they can be quite morbid and quite clinically relevant. So the data here show this is um, uh, cumulative risk by decade, 10 through 60, broken into uh, by sex. And you can see that both boys and girls by age 10 have around a 5% risk of developing one of these neoplasms as defined here. Um, now you can see as time goes on, the risk in, in, uh, in females increases um, and is higher than that of males, which tends to stay fairly flat around 10% until you get into to age 60, in which case um, the, um, uh, the males start to catch up, but our confidence intervals are quite a bit wider here. And this is driven, of course, by the gynecologic and the thyroid risks that we see, especially in females. So, um, again, this is the time to neoplasm in 101 non proband Dicer 1 carriers. So, uh, we think this is um, hopefully cl very, cl very uh, useful clinical data um, based on the, uh, the ascertainment of these individuals. So, the other thing that's been an important aspect of our study is identifying novel phenotypes or characterizing known phenotypes. So, I list here some of the novel tumor and non-tumor phenotypes identified by the study. Now, our study, of course, was not the first to recognize that thyroid cancer was a, or goiter was a risk in the Dicer-1 syndrome, but we did quantify it in a, in, a, in a rigorous way. And this work was published a couple of years ago in JCEM. And the take home message is that by the age of 40, 75% of females had had either a nodule or goiter or thyroidectomy of some kind, 75% of individuals with a Dicer-1 germline variant. And among males, it was about 20%, which is quite striking, but again, by age 40. So all that data is in that paper there. And then we had observed anecdotally a number of individuals, a number of kids who had microcephaly, a large head. So as part of the study, we were you know, rigorously measured head and arm span and height and so forth and did an analysis with a very talented um, um, fellow, uh, postbacterial fellow who actually went to medical school out there in Chicago at Rush. And this was reported a couple of years ago when we found that 42% um, of adults and children with a germline pathogenic variant in Dicer-1 had macrocephaly. Now they were not particularly tall or particularly short or had other dysmorphic features, but they definitely had the macrocephaly. So again, this is, really useful clinically. So if you have this app on your phone called face to gene it's something used by a lot of geneticists where they plug in dysmorphic features and it comes up with a differential diagnosis. If you plug in macrocephaly, Dicer-1 syndrome is definitely on that list and hopefully will prompt people to think about this disorder um, in conducting genetic testing, again, in the spirit of trying to identify individuals, especially children at risk. And then I list here a number of other papers in the spirit of the same thing found a modestly higher risk of congenital renal anomalies, um, some um, ocular anomalies, some unusual teeth findings. And then we have a paper and press right now um, with a French group that is a report of two individuals with um, testicular stromal tumors. That needs more work to quantify that, but it, it, that is something that we observed recently. And then just in the past year, we had a, a paper in Modern Pathology reporting this teratoma-like lesion in individuals with a Dicer-1 germline variant. 
Uh, here is the paper that reports the pleuropulmonary blastoma-like peritoneal sarcoma. And then um, this was published also last year, and, and this is not describing any novel features, but sort of a survey of gynecologic and reproductive health issues in, 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 in women with pathogenic germline variant in DICER-1, uh, developed with our GYN colleagues at the clinical center. So that's a broad overview of the key clinical features of DICER-1 syndrome. And what I wanted to do now is pivot to uh, some a sort of a practical guide on what to do if you have a person or a family in your clinic who has a, a germline DICER-1 variant. Um, you know, when should I think of DICER-1 and who should I test? And if positive, what do I do next? So we developed these surveillance guidelines published in 2018 in clinical cancer research with our colleagues at the um, at the PPB DICER-1 registry. Uh, and the images are, are sort of taken from that paper. So this is a busy slide, but this is table one in that paper. Um, and when should I think of DICER-1? Um, and we have here indications for DICER-1 testing and I added with pre and post test genetic counseling and education. So if you were to see an individual with, you know, obviously a PPB, but also lung cysts in childhood, especially if, if multiseptated or, or complex in any way, um, rhabdomyosarcomas or things that appear to be rhabdomyosarcomas, cystic nephroma, a variety of GU sarcomas, the Sertoli, the um, sex cord stromal tumors, the, certainly the cervical or ovarian rhabdomyosarcoma, um, broaden the net somewhat to include other neuroendocrine tumors in the GU and GYN systems, certainly multinodular goiter um, in children or with a family history, um, these nasal tumors, these eye tumors, and some unusual brain tumors. Um, these were defined as the more minor criteria, um, but in, in sort of two of these or one combined with one of these others certainly should prompt thinking of genetic testing. Although as time goes on, this, this is getting a little bit less and less rigorous as, as uh, the costs become cheaper and cheaper. Um, and there's, there's a listing of macrocephaly. So um, again, some basics on genetic testing, you know, who, who do you test? Ideally, you wanna test the person with the with the DICER-1 tumor or DICER-1 feature in the family. Um, ideally you want to test blood and the germline and um, do copy number, which is available through a lot of the large testing labs in addition to, se in addition to sequen ana sequence analysis and consider tumor or somatic DICER-1 sequencing, especially if the germline testing is unique because uh, it is, is negative, because if you find two somatic confined DICER-1 variants and negative germline testing, that's consistent with a non-inherited case or a sporadic tumor. It could also be consistent with mosaicism. And that's something that a genetic counselor or your friendly local geneticist can help you with, if need be. Um, if the individual you're testing is germline positive, then site-specific or testing just the particular variant in first-degree relatives is indicated. Um, as mentioned before, um, young children should be prioritized given the risk of PPB and cystic nephroma and given the fact that we can do something about that. And then this should be extended out even to more distantly related second, third degree relatives, especially if they're young children at risk. Um, and then newborns should be tested by age four months to, prevent, to permit pulmonary surveillance, basically a chest x-ray. And again, these are all guidelines that are very much spelled out in the uh, clinical cancer research paper that we published. So this is a table two from, from that paper that lists our suggested surveillance guidelines uh, for DICER-1 heterozygotes or DICER-1 carriers. Um, and uh, we sort of already described the involved systems and some of the symptoms and the tumors or the features that we're worried about. Uh, I don't wanna read all of this, but basically for screening or surveillance of the pulmonary pleuropulmonary blastoma, recommend chest x-ray early in life, complemented with a, a chest CT, um, and repeating the chest CT again in early childhood, and considering a chest x-ray um, every four to six months until eight years of age, um, and then annually till about 12, and then recommend a thyroid uh, around eight, and then repeating every three years, um, as well as some education about um, risk of thyroid cancer in the context or co possible increased risk in the context of chemotherapy or radiotherapy for other DICER-1 associated tumors. And then we advocated for 
pelvic and abdominal ultrasound screening every six to 12 months, um, starting around eight to 12 years, going to at least age 40. I realize that these are controversial and there's not much data to support them. Um, and other organizations, I know the Europeans are developing some um, surveillance guidelines that are, are not as aggressive. Um, you know, we, this is a, a dynamic process, but this is what we're recommending right now. And then for the, for the um, cystic, cystic nephroma risk, um, do ultrasound um, starting early in life every six months until age eight. Um, and the, as noted here, there are a variety of, of tumors associated with the head and neck and brain. I have heard proposals that a head MRI uh, be done. Um, that's done as a surveillance. That seemed awfully aggressive to most of us. For now, a lot of this is education exam and an eye exam, uh, regular eye exam looking for features of the eye tumors and certainly working up, um, including imaging, if there's a clinical concern for any of these features. Okay, so I wanted to, in the sort of about halfway done here, um, a little bit more than halfway done, pivot to what we talked about, the genome first approach to cancer genetics and to, with a specific example of DICER-1. And so I had shown this slide earlier about how we're trying to develop a multi-pronged strategy to prevent the progression from the, of these cystic lesions to full-blown sarcoma. And I've told you about um, how common these, these variants are, about the risk, about how to recognize clinically individuals who may be, or families that may be harboring these variants and what to do about them. So next I wanna tell you about our work to standardize the interpretation of DICER-1 variants and then this genome first approach. So quickly, um, there is a, um, in, an entity, a new entity, and this covers uh, many, many institutions uh, called the Clinical Genome Research or ClinGen. And ClinGen has a lot of, um, um, is, is, is conducting, as, as it says there, to create authoritative central resource that defines the clinical relevance of genes and variants for use in precision medicine and research. So ask really basic questions. Is this, is this gene associated with, with a disease? What's the clinical validity? Is this variant causative? What's the pathogenicity? And is the information actionable? What's the clinical utility? And has a pretty well organized knowledge base of all this information. What I wanted to talk about specifically today for a moment are what are called VSEPs. And VSEP, as shown up here, is a variant curation expert panel. And, a, and um, the idea here is to collect a group of individuals with an interest in a particular gene or set of genes or disorders and work together to modify the canonical genetic variant interpretation guidelines, which I list here, this is Richards et al. published in Genetics and Medicine in 2015. These are the so-called ACMG, American College of Medical Genetics, AMP, Association of Medical Pathology guidelines on the, on the interpretation of germline variation. They work generally pretty well, but there are specific, um, you know, genes, all genes, there are 20,000 genes and there are gonna be differences on how you, they should be interpreted. And so these VSEPs are a way to, to modify these guidelines. So they work really well or as well as they possibly can for a specific set of genes. So you can see there's a multi-step process here. It takes a couple of years to go from an idea to formulating the, formulating the rules, to testing them, to piloting them, uh, getting some feedback at a, at a variety of sta stages and then publishing the paper. So we put together um, the VSEP for DICER-1. We're actually now um, in this pilot rule phase. This slide's maybe six months old now. Um, and I, I list it here because if there is an interest in the audience for developing a VSEP or perhaps you're in, involved, would like to get involved with one, let me know. I am recently became the co-chair of the Hereditary Cancer Clinical Domain Working Group. 
And our responsibility is to sort of oversee the development of all of these VCEPs. And I work with Sharon Plon, who's a well-known geneticist, at, cancer geneticist at Baylor. So anyhow, we are doing this for DICER-1 and would expect to have a paper out in a year or so that has the specific guidance on how to interpret this germline variation. So next I wanna to pivot to what I mean by this genome first approach to, to, to genetics and specifically cancer genetics. So the traditional way of doing genetics is you, know, you look at, identify a phenotype and you, then you go to a genotype. So pattern recognition, you look at individuals and families, often relatively modest sized cohorts in the clinic, you use a variety of well-loved uh, techniques, candidate gene, linkage analysis, association studies, or family structure, and then you determine the, the genotype, Sanger, panels, exome genome arrays, or copy number. And this is, um, uh, tends to require special skills and syndrome identification, uh, clinical expertise. You have to find families who are affected and is fairly modest in its throughput. Um, this is the tried and true approach, but there's definitely some ascertainment bias and that you will miss people who never present to clinic at all, because why should they go to clinic if they're not having a, a phenotype associated with, the, with their germline variant? You can miss uh, rare or unknown manifestations of the disorder because of the ascertainment. You can overestimate the severity. Um, it's a lot of time and a lot of work to do so. So there is a new approach in which this paradigm is flipped, in which you start from the genotype, so from exomes or genomes or panels. You can use a variety of techniques, and then, then you look at phenotype. And this has the potential to be as focused or as broad as you want, because you can look as many genes as you want. It can, you can do this in an entire health system. You can plumb um, electronic medical record and you can look at many, many people. Um, and in fact, there are ent entire populations and entire countries uh, putting their electronic medical records online and doing large scale genotyping to, to do just this sort of thing. So this can be gene or pathway based. This is big data. There's a lot of infrastructure that's needed, lots of thought on bioinformatics and it has the potential to be higher throughput has a variety of names, genome first, public health genomics, population genomics, genetic medicine, so forth. And the possibilities of the opportunity here is, is that it reduces ascertainment bias, can provide the full phenotypic spectrum, especially at an older age, maybe a better gauge of severity, um, may offer better penetrance ep estimates, um, uh, the opportunity to interrogate multiple loci and pathways, and the opportunities for syndrome discovery. So I mentioned Geisinger a couple slides ago, um, and Geisinger is a uh, health system in, in um, central and northern Pennsylvania. You can see their uh, array of clinics here basically follows the, the uh, geographic position of the Appalachian Mountains. And this was the Geisinger Health System was founded over 100 years ago um, by the widow of a, of a, a a man who had made his money in coal mining and she wanted to provide health care for the miners. And so you can see that historical uh, fact is, um, is uh, displayed by the sort of the array of where the clinics are located. Anyhow, they cover many million, several million people. It's a relatively non-transient population. Um, there's not a lot of in and out migration and they started an EHR back in 1995. And um, maybe 10 years ago, they linked up with Regeneron, a drug company to do large scale uh, exome sequencing. And as of this month, they have over 175,000 of these exomes and arrays linked to the EHR. And the goal is to do 250,000. And they published a couple years ago, a paper in genetics and medicine that describes sort of what kind of data is available? You know, your uh, median uh, participant in this study had 12 years of EHR data and 60 clinical encounters and almost uh, you know, 455 lab results um, and a lot of vital sign measurements. This was on the first 50,000 individuals. And you can see there's a large range there. It tends to be an older data set um, and uh, reflects some of the, some of the pathologies of, of the population. So in this study, we, we worked with Geisinger and um, uh, uh, looked at DICER-1 variants um, and uh, identified those who harbored a loss of function or one of these hotspot variants 
in the germ line and identified carriers, what we call carriers, uh, to non-carriers or controls. And doing this type of study gives you thousands and thousands of potential controls because you can match on all sorts of different features. We looked in the EHR and both the carriers and the non-carriers or controls. And we um, worked with the Geisinger Cancer Registry and, and asked how many tumors um, the 25 germline Dicer 1 variant carriers uh, harbored. Um, and pulled those materials and did Dicer 1 somatic sequencing. We had the help of a statistician. So I've already shown you this slide. This is where we looked at the 92,000 people who were available to us. We defined what is a pathogenic variant in Dicer 1 uh, using fairly traditional uh, metrics here. And as mentioned earlier, we found 12 unique variants in 25 people. Um, and you can see the prevalence right there. Um, so next, of those 25 people, we, we did a query with the Dicer one, excuse me, with the Geisinger family, uh, Cancer Registry, which is, as the name suggests, the cancer registry for the Geisinger Health System going back into the 1940s. Um, this, of course, will not necessarily capture the tumors that are um, identified or treated outside the Geisinger Health System, but if someone who is in the Geisinger Health System goes outside the system, presumably a note or documentation of, of, of leaving the system to get care outside the system would be reflected in the Geisinger notes. So that's one caveat. But what we were able to do is query the, the Geisinger Cancer Registry and found four people of the 25, so 16%, um, who carried a, a tumor. And the germline Dicer 1 variant is listed here and the particular malignancy is listed here, and some of the demographics are listed here. And so you look at this and not surprisingly, we found two individuals with papillary thyroid cancer, an individual with a pineal blastoma actually, um, and um, somebody with a renal cell carcinoma. And we, working with the cancer registry, pulled the pathology materials. Now, unfortunately, some of these were quite old, and so the DNA failed quality control. But for one of the thyroid cancers, sure enough, when we sequenced them, we found a couple of the hotspot variants that you would expect to see somatically uh, in, the, in, in, in this disorder. Now, the other interesting thing you can do with EHR data um, is you can query for tumors or phenotypes um, that are known to be associated with your gene of interest and, um, and then test them. So, we said how many Sertoli Lydic cells and how many GYN and rhabdomyosarcomas are in the Dicer 1 cancer, in the Geisinger Cancer Registry, and found these two individuals. They did not have any germline Dicer 1 variation. And we pulled the pathology blocks and sequenced them, and sure enough, found uh, the two hits in Dicer 1 in these tumors. Um, that were completely expected. So they're, you know, they're sporadic, sp sporadic tumors. Um, and uh, it was a very satisfying little bit of this story. So we performed a manual review of the electronic health record in the 25 people with a, a pathogenic variant. Um, the demographics were very similar to that of the larger cohort. Interestingly, and perhaps not surprisingly, we didn't find the term Dicer 1 anywhere on the 25 charts. Two of the individuals were deceased, uh, one 44-year-old white female. She was the one who had the pineal blastoma at 16, and she also had a meningioma in her 40s. It wasn't actually clear what she died of. And there was a 75-year-old man who had hypothyroidism, again, thyroid problems, um, not surprisingly. He was the one with the renal cell carcinoma, but he, he lived into, be, into his 70s and appeared to die from complications of liver cirrhosis. What really surprised us was this 83-year-old woman who had a germline Dicer 1 hotspot variant. So this is predicted to be, to confer a much more severe phenotype for a variety of reasons. And this looks like it's, um, you know, so Sanger confirmed, it um, had a, um, a uh, did not appear to be some sort of low level mosaicism. This appeared to be the real deal as a heterozygote and she was, perfectly healthy, <laughs> had a few liver cysts on the abdominal ultrasound. Again, that's interesting because of the history of, of hepatic cysts that have been reported in this disorder and a breast biopsy, but it was otherwise healthy. So this is a, 
nice example of here's a variant that's predicted to be quite severe in somebody who has lived an apparently long, healthy life. Um, and we're working with Geisinger to bring or to try to bring um, these individuals to the clinical center. And so we can better understand um, and do more detailed phenotyping that's been possible through a review of the, of the EHR. The other thing you can do with the EHR data, as I said, is match um, your cases. In this case, we had these 25 uh, individuals with the germline DICER-1 variant to, con to controls you know, who had no DICER-1 variation at all. And you can match on, on sex and BMI, smoking status and so forth. And you can see for those who had the basically a loss of function or hotspot DICER-1 variant, you can see as expected an increased risk of thyroidectomy, a thyroid cancer, and there's a trend towards increased risk of goiter and thyrotoxicosis. Um, and when you look at the other um, types of DICER-1 variation, this was sort of predicted to be deleterious, sort of missense variation that was not hotspot. You don't really see much of an increased risk for anything. And these are variants that are variants of uncertain significance. Again, not much in the way of risk for these known phenotypes. And these are the likely benigns. Again, not surprisingly, not much risk. So what did we, what did we learn from this sort of genome first approach um, to looking at DICER-1? Well, we learned that we could refine the, the population prevalence. We learned that um, our observations of penetrance of thyroid disease and malignancy were akin to what we'd observed in the large cohort we put together at the NIH. Uh, with phenotype, there was no documentation of DICER-1 on the, on the chart. Um, and in the story of this apparently healthy 83-year-old with this bioinformatically predicted severe var hotspot variation was what got our attention. Um, you can see the role here of using human phenotypes themselves to inform bioinformatics, and that can help with um, interpretation of genetic variation. And then the other point here is that of productivity. Um, the risk estimates for thyroid and malignancy on these 25 cases was comparable to that of this really large natural history study we put together over many years. So there was a an efficiency certainly to using existing data. Um, and we don't wanna overinterpret this and we should be careful in that, but um, certainly, the, certainly the data complemented each other and it may be you know, in some cases in which this type of genome first approach really can be a quick way to determining, um, to estimating risk. So you know, what we took from this is that the genome first approach holds an enormous promise but the manual EHR review is messy, it's labor intensive, it's incomplete. Lots of groups are looking at the roles for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, even though we had a large cohort in 92,000 and now um, 175,000 people, even with a rare disease, you get modest numbers. So more sequencing and we're working with the UK Biobank, which has 200,000 individuals. NIH has a new study called All of Us, which will be a million. There are questions about scalability of return of results to research participants, and that covers a lot of domains, technology, funding, and policy. Um, and you know, sometimes it was humbling how limited their information was in, in family and then the clinic. And we're working to um, offer the opportunity for these guys here and um, participants to come to enroll in our study and come to the NIH and be more thoroughly phenotyped. So, in just the we have about ten minutes, I just want to quickly finish this up and have time for questions. One, one, um, one important bit of this is applying the principles of the genome first approach, you know, moving beyond DICER. So this is a figure that shows how microRNAs are processed. And DICER-1 is one of about a dozen genes involved in microRNA processing. There's exportin and RAN and DCGR8 and Drosha. Um, it's a pretty well understood system and there are about 12 genes. This paper um, was published in a couple of years ago, two years ago um, in JCI and it reported a family with germline variants in DGCR8, which is one of the microRNA processing genes. And interestingly, and this is the pedigree from the figure, this was I think a Cana French Canadian family there was a segregation of the variant with 
multinodule goiter, so that's akin to Dicer one, and schwannomatosis. So that's a type of, of uh, peripheral nervous system tumor that's definitely not seen in Dicer one, seen in NF1 and some resopathies, but um, that's unusual. And this is apparently a novel phenotype associated with this type of variation. So we asked, okay, how common do we see DGCR8 variants? Um, and we can nowadays easily query lots of different databases, 1,000 genomes, exact, 53,000, NOMAD, 100, almost 120,000 exomes. Internally, we have our own um, database. UK Biobank now has 200,000 exomes. The Geisinger is 176,000 exomes. And of course, these are linked to phenotype. And then there are cancer-specific exomes. So T, uh, TCGA uh, has germline data. Uh, the cancer childhood cancer survival study is something from NCI that will be published shortly. Um, at least the exomes will be available shortly through dbGaP, um, and then our own internal and inter internal data. So again, working with my uh, Northwestern trained uh, postdoctoral fellow, she constructed a query. Here's all these microRNA processing genes. Here's Dicer one and query and said, how often do you see loss of function variants in these different databases? And you can cast your eye and you can see that these are relatively rare. Um, here are the phenotype, here are the databases in which we have phenotype data, uh, the Geisinger data we're waiting for, and you can see the UK Biobank. Um, and then just as an example for DGCR8, she, uh, she found four people in the UK Biobank with loss of function variants a lot of these people have not particularly interesting phenotypes, but here's somebody who has multiple congenital malformation syndromes. That's what it was coded in the, in the EHR. Um, and that definitely merits some more investigation. It's entirely possible that this is explained by pathogenic variation in a gene unrelated to GGCR8, but we have an interest in microRNA processing genes, and this is something that we're following up and certainly applying to other uh, microRNA processing genes. So um, in conclusion then, um, hopefully I've shown you how we can integrate classical genetics and what we call public health genomics. So here's a map of Pennsylvania representing the Geisinger Health System. And this is an aerial view of the NIH Clinical Center. This is the older part and this is the newer part that opened about 15 years ago. So drawing upon resources like this and bringing patients to the clinical center, Looking at Dicer 1, looking at microRNA processing genes, I have colleagues who are working on P53, hope to identify you know, novel entities and potentially novel mechanisms and novel, novel biology. Just wanna show the acknowledgement slide for many people involved in a variety of institutions over the years on the Dicer 1 work. And I put here in this red box, my email address and the email address for the research nurse, Laura Harney, involved with the study, the 800 line and the study website. If you have patients who are interested, who, who have Dicer 1, basically the eligibility criteria is somebody who has a Dicer 1 tumor or, um, or known to have a Dicer 1 um, uh, mutation. I'd be happy to, to talk, either I or Laura, be happy to talk to you or the family about participation. Um, and uh, why don't I end there? Thank you for your attention and I'm um, happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah, hi, Doug. Thanks a lot. That was, that was great. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask a question related to prenatal uh, presentation. Um, are, have any of these PPBs been diagnosed uh, during fetal life uh, that you're aware of? So the reason I bring that up is that there's an entity that we see frequently on, on relatively frequently on uh, prenatal ultrasound uh, lung lesions that really look like those big cystic PPBs that you were showing, and they're called congenital pulmonary airway malformation, for lack of a better term. And I'm just wondering if if anybody has drawn a link between Dicer one and those. Could these uh, uh, CPAMs, is what we call them be like a precursor lesion for PPB because most of them are resected and they do fine, but there's a small percentage of, it sounds like a small percentage of, you know, sarcomatous uh, transformation later in life if they're left in situ. Yes. Yeah. So there, there are case reports of 
children in which a lung lesion was detected in utero and turned out to be a PPB type one. Um, but uh, it has to be you know, detectable on ultrasound and someone has to see it and has to think of it. So it is a relatively rare presentation. There is this, uh, yes, I'm aware of these uh, other mal uh, airway malformations and uh, can cause confusion. And our recommendation is if in doubt, have get a second opinion on the pathology um, or uh, you know, send to a, a center of expertise to make sure that what, what is billed as a airway malformation is not in fact a PPB. And again, I work with a PPB Dicer One Registry and the two pathologists there, uh, Pepper Daner and, and Ashley Hill, do this all the time, you know, look at these slides and, and help make these determinations about what's a PPB and what's not. So it's an, it's an important question. It is an ongoing cause of confusion. Of course, there's always genetic testing. Um, that's really the way to be the most certain. Okay, anybody else have any other questions? There's not anything in the chat box uh, right now. So if there's a, I'm pulling up the chat here. Oh, this is just a CME credit. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Well, great. Well, thanks uh, again. Um, it was a great presentation and I appreciate you taking the time out to educate us. My pleasure. I yeah. appreciate you um, joining and uh, paying attention. And um, I uh, hope, hope everyone learned something. And um, thank you again. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.